Hi everyone and welcome to session one, the first session, well, kind of the first session of the tabletop campaign known as the Athenaeum campaign. I say kind of sort of because we had a session zero prior to this. And so just as an FYI off the bat with everybody who is watching, um, if you are here to get the full story of this campaign, you do need to start with session zero, believe it or not. Session zero is when we did spend a few times, a few uh, moments just getting to know the players and getting to know the characters. But right after that, we actually dove right into some heavy duty role playing, um, which is a big part of the beginning or the origins of each of our characters and their storylines. So. Yes, uh, make sure that you um, watch session zero before you watch this, because if you don't, you might be a little lost, just to be perfectly honest. So as such, let us begin with our warm up question. So the warm up question for everyone is now that you all have had a sneak preview of, of each of the different characters, and we're going to I'm going to specifically um, talk about the main five characters. Um, which of the other PCs are you most looking forward to, most um, curious about having your character interact with, and why? And I do not want a cop-out answer of, oh, I want them to interact with all four. Well, I'm sure you do want to interact with all four. What, Which one in particular do you think would be the most interesting to interact with, and why? And if you do answer with a no-cop answer, then you will have to provide a reason for every single one why you really really <laughs> want to role play with every single one i would love star to meet tori because i think tori is such a fascinating young woman um the fact that she's like she's like angry teenager and goth princess <laughs> rolled into one i think it would be a fun interaction between star and tori because i would like to see us bounce ideas off each other and maybe conflict or have, I don't know, a pretty good friendship. So I'm excited. So that's me. I think we talked about it a little bit after our last session, but I would really love to meet Black Powder because I think, I I mean, I don't know if we would get along right away. I think um, we're probably going to have some sort of roast off with each other where we're just bouncing off insults from one another and so I think we'll start out kind of clashing with one another but it could form into something good down the road we'll see black to tory powder <laughs> like tory powder <laughs> tory powder <laughs> there we go I was gonna do the cop out answer but uh because I really do have a reason for everyone but I think out of all of you I would say tory as well Aww. yeah and I think because with Frankie, he's going to see Tori almost like a mirror of Victor being left behind. Almost like, here's another young person and I need to protect you. And it's going to be that, like, it's going to be a reminder, a constant reminder of like Victor being over there and like, well, I have to then do something here. And, and you're like the closest thing. And so, and the, with the elements of horror and all of that, it's going to flip him on his head because he's not used to any of that stuff. Hashtag Torenki. Yeah. <laughs> yes! <laughs> that one's cute. When it, and just to clarify to everybody who's watching, when, when I give pairings, it's not necessarily in a romantic way. It could be completely different from sure. romantically when I'm doing pairings like that. All right, who would like to go next? I'll go next. Okay, <laughs> Sam, I'm curious about this one. I think for Sam, I there are a couple, but I think the one that like really intrigues me the most is actually Frankie. Mm. Be, as a you know, as a kind of warrior kind of built to be that warrior piece, I think there's a lot of things that Sam can really uh, like identify on that front, but it's the emotional stuff. I think that'll be the most intriguing for Sam because, of course, in his genre and era, um, men are very stoic and everything. So it'll be great bits of character development for Sam, for Sam's character. So that one for me, I think, takes the cake. 
<laughs> I've been trying to sort out who would be the most, and I'm gonna have to go with a cop out answer. <laughs> All right, <laughs> give I us can't. a reason for every single one. Well, there you go. All right, well, starting with Sam. Sam and Black Powder, from what I can tell so far, are both extremely similar but complete opposites. And I'm excited to see if they will either become really good friends or not like each other at all. I don't really see there being an in-between. <laughs> Star is everything in Black that Black Powder's world is kind of anti is kind of against being gender non-conforming, magical, technically not even human. You're like a fairy. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, Black Powder's going to be crazy uncomfortable with this. It's like, whoa, <laughs> culture shock. Frankie is like the one person I think could maybe make Black Powder decent. Because <laughs> hmm. he, he, he has a sympathetic side. But at the same time, he would also be terrified of Frankie because the science that brought him to life could be seen as magic in his world. And Tori is a child, a girl, and magical, which are all three things that like Black Powder's like, hmm. Keep it away from my mm -mm. keep it away from my ship. Right. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and considering that she's got a voodoo background and your are your world is so big into superstitions. Yeah. And, so it's and curses and, and mm -hmm. superstition not very progressive in their ideas of women or like homosexuality or any kind of thing like that. Like all of them are gonna be problematic in their own way at least when it comes to coming to his world and him adjusting to the way other people are <laughs> totally awesome thank you very much for everybody's answers cool so to start things off one more time everyone please roll for me 3d6s let us randomize things again one more time 10. Ooh, frankie this is a great way to, to start things off okay so Frankie, um, by this moment, we are now in book two. Okay. Um, and just so that the players, or not the players, well, I guess both the players and the viewers are caught up. Can you give us the synopsis of book one, which is called what again? Awaken. Awaken. Give us a synopsis, please. Yes. So Awaken um, is the origin story for Frankie. And it starts with Victor um trying to get revenge for everything that he's lost in this um, post-apocalyptic dystopian world and he creates this weapon frankie and then over the course of the book they just fall in love really um between those two characters but henry is the triangle in that love triangle um and so Henry comes in at the end and just throws everything into chaos when he essentially reports them to the main government organization and they all get captured. So that's how it ends. Yes. And in the beginning of the second book, Forsaken, uh, Frankie finds at least himself, you know, captured bound, um, trying to find a way to escape. Um, he does manage to escape, unfortunately not without Victor, I believe. Okay, so currently, the, um, he knows that Victor has been captured. He doesn't know where exactly he is or where he's been taken. Hopefully he's still alive, he doesn't know. And eventually, again, correct me if I'm wrong, he eventually makes his way back to the Resistance. Yes. Or, or however you refer to yourselves as. Do you just refer to yourselves as the Resistance? or? Yeah, I mean, that's a fair, yeah, that's a good enough term for them. Okay. Yeah, I mean, something, you know, pretty generic is perfectly fine. Um, and so he reunites again with Felix and Agatha. Yes. So, to open things up in this scene, um, Felix and Agatha are still trying to get a lead as to where Victor is, because, of course, they're very good friends with him. So that's still in development. Nothing major has come up yet. They have some, they have run into a few dead ends um, and are still working on locating him. At this moment, you are on a mission, uh, Frankie, and you are with um, Agatha and Felix. And you are in the middle of a war zone right now. Um, both the resistance and the government are in a battle with each other and again this is this is a 
the the main reason why the government is antagonizing this particular group is because they're kind of seeking out and hunting down psionics people with psionic abilities and for what purposes you can probably pre presume why is it experimentation is it because they want to utilize their abilities is it because they just want to exterminate them completely because they think that they're unnatural it's like i guess there's many theories as to why it's happening but um the psionics are feeling threatened and therefore right now they are trying to um they're trying to basically fight off these forces meanwhile um you all um knew about this school or this um basically this this organization that is trying to uh teach people with psionic abilities it's sort of like a psychic school a hogwarts school for psychics i guess if you want to call it that um and the school basically um was discovered by the government and they basically had sent people to capture um the students there and so Frankie's mission with the brothers and sis brother and sister is to go in and save them before they get captured. And so you manage to find the students in time and manage to escape with them. But now you're in pursuit of of these soldiers, and so you're kind of playing escort. You know, in those video games, it's like an escort mission, <laughs> but an escort mission with about. Um, almost two dozen students, and so right now um, Felix is is using his abilities to sort of put up a barrier around these students. These students are really green, so they certainly are no match, at least by themselves, against these very highly trained soldiers who are specifically trained to um, combat psionics and. Um, I think that Agatha is trying to lead the way and get you all to safety. Frankie, can you um, paint us a picture as to what are the things that is Frankie is doing during this escort mission? They probably are going to count on you to be more of the offensive the side versus the defensive of things. Um, so just tell me a little bit like how you combat these soldiers in a cinematic way. Um, how Frankie combats them? Yeah, how he fights them off. Sure. Um, so Frankie definitely uses more of his kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat um, style, but he complements it with his own sonic abilities that he had developed um, when him and Victor kind of um, kissed for the first time so he has been using his abilities um, he use he can also create a barrier to protect um, his friends um, but mostly he just em he empowers his fists and he will tend to just go right into hand to hand and add extra damage as he is punching and brawling with the soldiers um, you know light shimmers around his hands every time he uses his powers and it's just this huge like psionic strike that he um, knocks the soldiers out with yeah he's also good with um, just general telekinesis he can't it's probably not as good as Felix um, but just um, yeah I'm going to say that um, there was a wave that attacked you and Frankie thanks to Frankie's help um, he was able to incapacitate them now does frankie attack to kill does he attack no. to knock out okay. he does not kill um okay. well he tries not to kill he may end up killing but that's not what his intent is he definitely just tries to knock them out okay when victor is training programming whatever you're calling it victor does he explicitly tell him not to kill? Or does he actually explicitly tell him killing is fine? So I think initially killing is fine. Um, From Victor. Okay. Yes. I and would I, think that's realistic too. Yeah. And I think within Frankie is what kind of kicks in is like, that I really should. Mm. Okay. And so, yeah. Got it. Okay, cool. You managed to um, at least... 
get yourselves to some safety. You're not, you're not, um, you're not out of the woods yet. Um, you're probably about halfway back to the camp that you all were at um, before you were dispatched dispatched on this mission. And um, Felix is uh, just gonna tell it. All right, I think we're. Are we safe, Agatha? And Agatha is going to be surveying the area. And she says, I think we're good for now. And Felix is just exhausted because he's been using all of his energy to create these barriers. And he says, all right, I just need a minute or f 10, he says, as he sort of like drops down and he takes a, you know, starts opening up his uh, flask to start drinking some water. Um, the students are very um, shaken up because they, they literally had bullets like firing at them. So they're kind of huddling together. They look very lost. They look very frightened, very scared. Agatha is going to maintain keeping a watch out. What do you do, Frankie? Um, Frankie is probably taking the rear guard of the group as Agatha and Felix is leading. And as uh, Felix brings down the barrier, he keeps an extra watch to make sure nothing is coming from behind. And for those that are, you know, the kids that are nearby, he will um, kind of reach down to them. It's like, are, are, are you all okay? Is, you know, and I know, you know, Felix is bringing down the barrier for now, but don't, don't be scared, okay? Don't, I am here to protect you. The group of students, um when they when you start actually talking to them for the first time some of them you do feel like uh pull back a bit and you can tell that they are probably as frightened of you as as they are of some of the people that were firing at them um mostly because the the government is at least a known entity and you're just kind of a puzzle to them because out of character, you're kind of a bunch of sewn up corpses, yeah, I'm sort of mod. sewn together. Yeah. You're, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So there definitely is an unease when you're talking to them, and you know some of the younger ones are shaking a little bit uncontrollably, uh, and I don't think any one of them will at least respond yet to what you asked. Okay. Um he like reaches into his pocket and like finds some like rations um especially more the sweeter kind <laughs> and um offers it to the kids like here at, at least have this little treat to just ease ease a little bit this, they're good they're sweet please try try them agatha will say go ahead she's trying to be reassuring and one of the braver probably older um, kids will cautiously reach out, you know, and just open the rations and carefully start distributing them to some of the other people. There's this one girl, I would probably say she's only eight years old, and uh, she's just watching you very curiously. She doesn't seem to be frightened of you, but more puzzled. And she asks, What are you? I... I am a, I'm a person, just, um, just different. Don't, don't be scared of me. I've never seen anybody look like you before. The way that you were fighting all those soldiers, it was, I've never seen anybody move the way you do. Yes, I, well, I was designed for this kind of thing, so it, this is very natural for me. So you're a machine? One of the other kids ask. Well, not exactly a machine, but you could call me that if you will. Sure. I mean, I was created like you created a machine. Some of the students in the back are whispering to each other. If you would like to, you may roll a hearing. Uh, we'll take a minus... Give yourself a minus three penalty because they're trying to whisper and not have you hear them. 
Okay. 12. Okay, so you didn't hear what they're saying. Nope. Um, roll an empathy. Okay. You gather that about half of the students are warming up to you. The other half are still suspicious. Okay. I will uh, go towards the little girl that's still talking to me and sure. just, um, you know, but, and he'll kneel down so that he is more at her level and he's not trying to scare anyone and especially to reassure the other kids like he's um, not a threat of any kind to them. Um, you, you're a very brave little girl, you know that? I, I like that. Me? Yes. Brave? Sure. Well, not as brave as you. You went over there and, and, you know, you went right into all of those soldiers without even having a, having a second thought. But I can tell that you're gonna grow up to be someone just like me. So, hold on to that, okay? Okay. She'll what give is- you a big, big smile. And with that, he just looks at some of the other kids and, like, gives them all a thumbs up, like... <laughs> he's like an awkward... <laughs> yeah, like, he's just kind of trying to be friendly and he is not really, like, sure on what to do, like... Uh... I almost want to make it, like, Spider-Man 3, <laughs> Tobey Maguire. <laughs> I could do it. <laughs> yeah, he has no real people <laughs> skills. So he's just trying his best in its awkward way to like Yeah. Alright. Agatha says Frankie, Felix, let's move. Okay, and he'll get up from that and go to Agatha and Felix's um and to Felix Felix uh he's like how, how are you doing? Do you feel good? Well, I, if I was being honest, that last wave kind of took a lot out of me. I don't know if I can necessarily... I don't know if we can necessarily um, manage another wave like that, at least not for the next half hour or so. Okay, well, just do your best, and um, I'll, I'll keep watching on, on the back, make sure nothing comes up and uh, catches us, so... How much longer do you think we have? And Agatha will respond, if we hustle, we should be able to get back to the base in 40 minutes or so. Okay. Felix, do you think you can hold out for that long? I don't know if I'll have much of a choice, Felix says. Okay. I'll just do your best. Um, Just letting you know that I'm here for you, so. He'll give you a thumbs up. You guys will hustle for a bit for about 10 minutes or so, and then you will reach a clearing in the in the woods. And the clearing um, seems to, it looks like it's, it's, it's a clearing where a group of people had set up camp. And by group of people, I mean like probably a force of like 30 people had set up camp but they're no longer there um you can see like a put out campfire and other things of that nature you can see spots where like large tents were placed and agatha kind of puts a hand up to everybody and she says wait here for a moment and she's just going to walk over into the into the um center of the camp and Felix has got his rifle his rifle like aimed around just keeping the close eye just to make sure nobody else is actually there there's a little bit of you know excess trash and debris that were left behind and then you see um, you see that Agatha notices something on the ground and she'll go ahead and pick it up you can see that it's a glove of some sort And then Agatha, she picks up the glove, and then you can see her eyes turning white, almost like Storm from the X-Men white. And you realize that she's using her psychometry. So one of Agatha's biggest gifts is, for people who don't know what psychometry is, it's the ability to be able to pick up like the history of an object, of an unattended object, and get information from said object, which has been extremely, like, useful to your group from a tactical sense and um, 
She then returns back to the group, holding up the glove. This was owned by Vanguard Kerwin himself. Looks like he's here. Seems like they had left camps around an hour and a half ago. Oh, so they're they're kind of close still. Yes, which means we really need to move fast. Okay. Um, I mean, we know which direction we have to head out, right? So let's let's try to gather the kids as, as best as possible and as quickly. Let, let's just go ahead and head out. Roll a hearing, perception hearing, please. Yeah. Oh my. I'm just too distracted by everything. Oh my. Okay. You hear a the sh- the sound of a gunshot being fired, and unfortunately, you didn't hear it quick enough. And you see that one of the students starts bleeding on in their shoulder, um, and they didn't even like notice at first that they'd been shot. They looks at it puzzled, and then the the student. Um, kind of falls to the ground and several of the others gasp. And almost as immediately as that happens, uh, you hear Agatha yell out, all of this is going in slow motion, but you hear Agatha yell out, get down! And then um, once again, Felix uh, attempts to hold up a barrier and a lot of the way that he forms barriers, he uses his hands a lot. And you hear another gunfire. And you hear Felix yell in pain as you see that his uh, right hand has been shot, like right through the palm of his hand has been shot. Oh, no. Which c- completely takes out Felix, at least for the next several rounds, from putting up a barrier. What do you do, Frankie? Um, so, Frankie instinctively wants to save the kid who's dying, um, but as yeah. Felix's barrier kind of, does his barrier come down when he gets shot in the hand? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So then he will actually then do use his own barrier as a backup but he is very limited in his own barrier so he will go towards the direction of the gunfire and he will also kind of put his hands up um, but then he has to anchor himself in place and as he does that he creates his own kind of one directional wall um, to try to block any um, bullet fire and yells at Felix get the kids get the one that got shot get him up and and I'll try to hold him up as best I can and he'll just try to just be in place holding any kind of gunfire there at least in the next several rounds Felix is still reacting to his shot hand so he's not gonna be able to tent anyone at least the next few moments Agatha is going to quickly um, rush towards the person who got shot roll me a perception roll <laughs> Come on, Frankie. Oh, nice. yeah. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> okay. Your um, heightened, like, uh, robotic, like, receptors, your eyes, um, are surveying the, the area because you, you haven't seen who shot, the, who fired that shot. And uh, Agatha finally will yell out, It's a sniper. It's a sniper. And you look up and you'll see that in one of the trees, there appears to be um, somebody dressed in a soldier's outfit from the government um, who seems to be uh, reloading their, their sniper rifle right now. How high up, how high up is the sniper? Um, I would say a good uh, two stories high. Two stories, I would say, give or take. Okay. Um, with that, he will drop his wall and begin advancing towards the sniper as fast as he can. Um, initially on the ground, he is just trucking through um, the trail. And as he gets closer and closer, he puts out his hand again and telekinetically kind of is creating like steps for himself Ooh. to walk up. So I love he, it. He is like just trucking it up into the air, um, just like focused and just watching him at the at every moment to make sure that 
he is not ready to take another shot. So he's okay. just moving. You're you're gonna have to cover a good amount of ground to get to him before he can fire his next shot. Give me a running, I guess running roll or whatever roll you want to roll. Speed roll. Um, oh yeah, whatever you think good. is appropriate. Come on, Frankie. <laughs> so I got a seven. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think that will make you close the sniper is pretty far away so um you, you will close a good amount of distance and you will probably reach relatively close to him not enough to like grab him or anything but maybe close enough to deflect if you like um as he's trying starting to line up his shot and he's going to fire again before you reach him i would probably say you're a good um, 10 yards from him at this point. So what do you do as he's about to fire his next shot? Um, is he about to fire like right at me? No, or... it doesn't look like he's firing at you. It looks like he's trying to fire at somebody else from the group. Um, if you want, you can roll uh, intuition or something along those lines to determine who he's aiming at, if you'd like. I think though... I don't think it's gonna matter. I'm gonna okay. try to move. Well, do I have enough time to get in the way of the shot? Yes, you are. You do. I am definitely gonna try to get into the way of the shot. So as I see him point, I am gonna change direction to just get nice. right in between the bullet shot. Good. Um, I think that will require. What what role do you think? Like speed again? Uh, yeah. And actually, it does default to health. It's like health minus five. So we'll see if I can do it. Uh, let's, uh, it'll just be another 3d6. What I get? Oh, no. I just barely miss. Okay. All right. He is going to fire another shot. You're not going to be able to tell what the result of that shot was. Mm -hmm. um, but you do manage to close to him, at him as he's lining him a shot again. And you realize when you get to him that he is a much younger soldier than you're normally like accustomed to and he's the way that he's sort of like shaking as he's quickly trying to reload his weapon again you can tell he's pretty green okay um i failed to get in between that shot but i'll continue my run up to him and as i as i get there i'll just tackle him instead You'll tackle him. yeah okay. i'm just gonna full on trying to tackle him you tackle him <laughs> He's up in a tree, so you guys are going to fall yeah. towards the ground. Um, and are you going to fall such that he's going to hit the ground first, or you're going to hit the ground first? How are you going to... So I'm going to try to tackle him, but at the same time, I have a gliding ability, so I will tackle him, try to grab him, and then as I come down, like slow down our fall as best as I can okay. so that we don't just crash. Um, yeah, it's gonna I, be awkward. I'd like for you to roll for that to not to land too fast. Okay, I'm gonna roll an aerobatics check. Nine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you manage to keep things controlled as you make your way down and glide your way down to the ground. And uh, once you do, the this kid is is like terrified. This big giant creature of a man has got him pinned basically yeah um i will snatch i will try to definitely like snatch that rifle out of him if he's still holding on to it and and then i will just kind of grab him not really by the neck but just by like the clothes and from front of him just kind of hold him up and you know what are you doing why what are you shooting at us who are you he says you're the enemies He's, he's, you, he's, he's, he's very scared. And he says, let, let, let me go, you, you, you freak. Now pull him in closer. Go home. Never pick up a rifle again. If you attack us ever again, you will regret it. And then he'll like shove him back and then let him go. He he'll he'll he's gonna think um, 
for a moment what he should do, but he decides it's not worth sticking around, so he just books it. He just runs off and books it. And then Frankie goes back the other way and see who else is hurt and see if he can help in any way. So he's like now booking it back to the camp. Um, you're, you're gonna book it back to the to the group, right? Yeah, to the you're group. You're gonna make your way back to the group, and as you get close enough to see um, to see the group, you find Agatha on the ground, and she's unconscious. Next character. <laughs> okay. My heart. Good job, Frankie. Uh, Good job. Yes. Great. Oh my god. Great start. Oh my god. Right. <laughs> oh man. Oh my gosh. I was gonna say I tried to give you a chance to save Frankie. Tried to give you a chance to save Agatha. It's okay, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so, who's next in the initiative order? Black Powder. Black Powder. Okay, Black Powder. So, Black Powder, um, give me... So, you, you all are trying to follow a lead to find the Atoll of Whispers. Mm -hmm. And when you reach um, a portion of the sea... The, the weather shifts a little bit, and as somebody who's, who's used to being um, out in the seas for as many years as you have, the, the sudden change of weather is not natural. Um, the temperature dip downs a little bit, and a sort of like fog starts to, starts to form. Um, again, a lot more rapidly. It's almost like instantaneous that things like start to fog up. Um, and the crew is reacting like, oh, this is really bizarre. Uh, if he's not in the middle of working, he'll definitely like stand out on the deck and just kind of try to observe what's going on in the ocean, going over in his mind what he knows can cause this kind of thing. If it doesn't seem natural, if it seems too fast, then it could be a curse. It could be someone did something wrong. It could be a uh, like an evil spirit kind of thing, and he's yeah. just going over what could this be. Okay, roll. Uh, uh, what would probably be a good roll for that? Do you think intuition? Uh, something along those lines. Yeah, intuition probably would work. Okay, go ahead and roll me that. Hey, barely made it, but I made it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This definitely feels like something that's more supernatural um, whether it's because of a curse or whether it's because of some sort of magical like weather spell or whatever you're not 100% sure but yeah this is not this is definitely something that's more magical in nature with the bad weather I'm guessing the captain's out and about yeah yeah, the captain's out and about, and um, he, I mean, the captain is clearly the most experienced member of this of this crew, but the, the crew overall is not nearly as experienced as you are. So he probably is going to find this sudden shift curious, but I don't think he's going to be as suspicious about it as you probably are. I'm going to go approach the captain in a respectful manner. <laughs> Mr. Lee, you're up on the deck? Aye, nothing to cook for right now, sir. Can't help but notice I've seen this sort of thing before. Aye, this fog is... this fog is pretty dense. We're having... I'm imagining we're going to have some problems navigating our way through this. Aye. Captain, if you'll, uh... Just take a word from someone who's been saying it a long time. This isn't natural. My recommendation would be to keep guard up. Oh? It's a... With all due respect, Mr. Lee, it's, it's a fog. That came in way too fast, sir. I recognize your authority, sir, and I only give recommendations based on my own experience. I haven't said for as long as I have. There's something... 
unnatural. You'll hear Jim uh, pipe up. He actually overheard your conversation and he walked up to you and he says, Captain, I've I've heard stories about these kind of things. You don't think you don't think that there's a ghost ship around, do you? Uh, the captain shudders a little bit. Now the captain just is very superstitious as well, just as much, and he says, "Boy, don't speak of things. Such things could easily end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy." Oh. Jim says, I didn't realize that that's how that works. I am not really sure either, but better safe than sorry. Don't speak says. it into the wind or else it'll carry it towards you. Um, at that point, you hear a strange noise uh, coming from out in the distance. What was that? I've never heard that noise before. <laughs> roll, uh, I'm gonna say, um, is there a roll that you could roll for like uh, magic, uh, mystical creatures, or legendary creatures, or uh, um, maybe even like s s superstitious stories, or you know, what I'm, you know, something along those lines, local lore. Sea lore, um, anything along those lines. There's like occultism. Occultism could be a kind of. Uh, I don't have anything like that. Would my eidetic memory help with anything like this? Um, uh, roll and see. Let, roll and, and and I want to see how how low you get. Okay. Like how accurate? I, I've been forgetting. I do have lucky, so I technically roll three rolls. Okay. I like yeah, that's that's good. That's definitely good. <laughs> er yeah, because I have the extraordinary luck. Let me double check. Is this considered part of like your normal world though? If it is, it's just <laughs> history. Kind of shit, yeah. <laughs> because if it is, it's just it could just be history for you. Like <laughs> I, I don't have history specifically okay. either. <laughs> okay. I never went to school. <laughs> uh yeah, I, I take three rolls and I take the best. Alright, so the best one was the 8 versus 14. Okay. Um, 8 versus 14. So, I mean, you've heard a lot of stories about mystical sea creatures. Um, they're one of which, one of your favorite stories, well, I don't know by favorite, but is uh, the story, for example, of this ghost whale which actually out of character is from Japanese, real life Japanese lore. Um, uh, this, this almost like a phantom, phantom whale of a creature. And so you might have suspicions that it's something like that. Although, um, cause, cause when they're, they do say that when the phantom whale is around, like there is like this fog that appears with it, but your gut tells you this is actually something else. And um, unfortunately, you might have remembered another creature that sort of like follows with a fog, but you can't quite put your finger onto what else it was. But it's probably in the same caliber as a phantom whale, which may not necessarily make you feel any more comfortable. <laughs> Keep an eye on the water, Captain. There's something phantom beast looking around, I suspect. I'm afraid that it's going to be hard for us to stay on the alert when we can't even see more than three feet in front of us. That's why you use your ears, Captain. Trust me. Things travel... Uh, fog is difficult to see through, but easy to hear through. It makes the air dense. Things echo less. You hear it in a completely different direction. And at that moment, that's when, when um, with the lucky rolls that you had, you start to realize it sounds like a giant cat. <laughs> it's almost like a giant cat. <laughs> but it couldn't be a giant cat, could it? That sounds like a weird thing to, to find in the middle of the ocean, right? So you're a little confused by that maybe. Perhaps a giant catfish. <laughs> catfish, Mr. Lee? It, 
Then, you ever hear a cat counter roll? I don't believe so. Alright. It sounds like that, but usually much quainter. Hmm. You will then um, now start to see in the distance this large silhouette. And the silhouette, you can clearly actually see the um, this round face and these pointed ears. And you actually see what appears to be tentacle-looking things underneath it. And then you also see something that's like flapping, almost like bat wings. So putting all that together, uh, out of character might be a bit of a nope, 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 nope kind of uh, <laughs> feeling. Um, so you can probably see it, uh, but it doesn't look like any of the crew has noticed it yet. But I'll just nudge Jim if he's still near me. Lad, do you see that? He looks up and his face suddenly turns white. What is that creature? No idea, but good to know it's not a mirage. <laughs> um... Suddenly, the ship starts to rock violently, and you see what appears to be a greenish looking tentacle, furry kind of tentacle. And finally, um, breaking through the fog, you will see this thing. Behold, the mighty captain! The Catkin has been oh. released. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, for a moment I thought it was going to be Cthulhu. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking the same. <laughs> it is the Catkin. Oh, wow. <laughs> Would I know anything about the Catkin? <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead and roll uh, the same roll that you rolled before. That lucky is going to be very for you. Oh yeah. <laughs> Is it every single time you roll any check? It's uh, every single I'm time? I'm double checking because I have like the highest version of it. I have extraordinary luck. Uh, okay. Well, okay. Usable every 30 minutes in game time. Every 30. Okay, okay. So you can't use it again. No. Go ahead. But use. Go ahead and roll me another IQ. Oh, I still nice. Barely made it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, so, Frankie. I'm taking all your rolls. <laughs> the catkin is. The catkin is not necessarily um, a. What do you want? What's the right word? Malevolent. He's not evil per se. Yeah, he's not malevolent per se, but it's very mischievous. It likes to play th with things. So unfortunately, when it tries, it likes to play with things. It normally likes to play with ships, and ships end up like not surviving after it's done playing with it. And so, um, so that's something you know. One thing that you do know, though, it's it's very easily distracted by like by like shiny objects or lights if something like a laser pointer would actually exist here a laser pointer would be very like useful but you don't have laser pointers so think oh, about right. <laughs> but yeah it's distracted by very shiny objects or very bright lights Captain. Yeah. good thing is it's not evil well that's a good thing tell it to stop rocking the boat then but it just wants to play uh, well, um, how do we tell it that uh, that uh, consent is important for these kinds of things? <laughs> well, I don't know if he actually understands human speech, sir, but it is easily distracted by shiny things, which you might want to do. And if we can spare, spare it, obviously, is take one of the uh, one of the uh, keel boats and set some things inside it on fire and drift it away, so it gets distracted and it goes off in another direction. The captain rubs his chin. Sounds like a crazy plan, but it just might work. Oh! And you roll over, and the boat is like... I grab onto something, because... Yeah. <laughs> Jim almost um, falls overboard, actually. Um, but I'm going to say that uh, Gregor, you know, gets a hold of him. Watch your step, boy! Uh, Gregor says. Um, by this point, the, the cat is, is starting to, like... You know, it doesn't look like the boat is going to tip over, but it's getting like gradually more, like yeah, <laughs> I have, sort I have of like six cats. Yeah. I know how they play. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Oh boy. So, um, 
the the crew is actually te like terrified because you know some of the crew members are going to say I don't want to die I don't want to die I'm too young to die <laughs> pull yourself together Gregor says we need to get the ship loaded with all this firewood and so they're going to start to execute this plan this elaborate plan for the firewood um, and then uh, Jim is going to you know you know help out and probably going to fetch um some what would they use like fuel to they, like like uh, do they have oil they, like, they, they would use uh oil usually it come uh at that period in time it would have been whale oil actually but, okay because whaling was such a big industry right then um you have a little bit of oil mostly wood and coal honestly would be their okay 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 cool uh so jim will be in charge of or fetching the oil um and they're going to pour it into one of the the small boats that you were talking about and um, light the thing on fire and start to set it on its merry way. Uh, as soon as you do that, the rough shaking of the ship stops and then you can see the silhouette like starting to move and follow after the, the boat. And eventually the fog starts to lift and things are a lot calmer. Oh, wow, Mr. Lee, your uh, plan actually worked, Jim said. I mean, it's, it's just a, gi a giant cat. I mean, they like to cause trouble, but they're just looking for a wee bit of fun. <laughs> I agree with Jimmy, Mr. Lee. Thanks to your quick thinking, we were able to get out of that mess. One that could have proven very fatal for our crew. With our crew, we look out for each other. That's what we do. Well, tonight we are going to have to uh, give you a special toast in honor of your heroism today. Absolutely. I think Mr. Lee definitely deserves it. And there's like cheers around the crew for, uh, for the great, uh, like I said, the amazing intelligent plan that Mr. Lee had helped th for them to survive another day. He's going to act kind of like, like humble about it. It's like, yeah, it wasn't nothing. I'm like, yeah, it did nothing. Uh, but once he gets a chance and he's like making his way back down into the galley, um, if he can just get a quick eye line to Gregor, he'll just give him a quick little wink, like, told you so, and just keeps going. Yeah. Gregor is going to, you know, he's going to give you a, he'll wrinkle his nose a little bit as a response. And uh, I think later uh, Gregor is going to come visit you uh, in the kitchen as you're preparing the food and uh, he's just going to come downstairs and he's going to go <laughs> sounds like you've become quite uh, quite popular in this crew as of late seems so how do you do that I talk apparently problem is the more that I talk the more people don't like me you just don't talk in the right way. You, you come off a bit intimidated, Matt. Me? Intimidating? Well, yeah. I take offense to that. Well, intimidating to the boys, anyways. What about my the way that I speak to the boys is intimidating? It's not necessarily the way you speak to them all the time. It's, a uh, Younger lads often get intimidated by those they think are better than them. You heard Jones during that whole spell. He was spouting about how he, everybody was going to die and how he wants his mommy. And You can't be that way out here in the sea. You're not going to survive. I had to, I have to toughen him up. I have to toughen this entire crew up. Oh, absolutely. I agree. There ain't nothing wrong with that, lad. Uh, you, like, from what I've seen, obviously, I haven't known you as long as I've known some, some of the other members in the crew. But... If you want people to hear you, and you want people to listen, you need to make sure they can't look anywhere else, and not through being loud or through being s s angry or yelling or nothing like that. The best way to do is to make them listen, is to lower your voice, look them directly in the eye, and tell them straight up what needs done in a calm manner 
If you keep your head out here, they immediately respect you more. I don't know if I have the patience for that, to be honest. Uh, how old are you? I just had my 24th birthday, uh, just before we set sail. You're still fairly young, lad. Patience comes with age and getting all that youthful energy out of you. You never mentioned how old you were, Mr. Lee. To be fair, I don't exactly know. I'm somewhere in my 50th. 50 somewheres. How do you not know your age? Don't know my birthday. I, out of character, I guess that makes sense to him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm somewhere 51, 52-ish. I think I know roughly, but I don't know an exact any age. So what happens when you grow up in an orphanage, lad? So, you weren't the least bit frightened of that creature? I mean, that was... I was concerned at first before I knew what it was, and I knew it could be dangerous, but I also knew how to deal with it. If you know how to handle something, it's a lot easier to not let fear get in the way. So, what does scare you then, Mr. Lee? Now that can be very sensitive uh, information, lad. Well, you're good, so good at talking. He's going to actually like look you right in the eye. He pretty much does exactly what you said. He looks at you right in the eye, and, he's, and he says, I'm just curious, as somebody who never seems to be shaken up about anything, have you ever found yourself in a scary situation? I've been scared, but once you reach a certain point in time, you stop being scared altogether. Because either I'm going to reach my dream or I'm going to die. What's the worst that can happen at that point? We're all going to die at some point, Mr. Lee. No point in being afraid of it. Fair enough. At that point, uh, he will stop because he can hear that somebody is coming, starting to coming in. And of course, you'll see Jim uh, going downstairs. And he says, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, the, the captain um, wanted to ask uh, you uh, which of the fine wines we should be opening up tonight. He says he'd like to pick out something that you particularly favor in your honor. Oh, well, uh, never been much of a wine drinker that day. Tell the captain I'll trust his choice. Do you at least have a preference of white versus what, red? Mm, not really. I guess I more of a more of a rum man. Not very much in the wine. Wine's for rich people. I'll let the captain know. Mr. Zemnian, um, thank you for stopping me from falling overboard. Well, don't make me do it twice, he says. The second time it happens, that's on you. So I gave you a bit of a freebie. Understood, sir, Jim says, and he's going to go upstairs. He's such an innocent lad, isn't he? He says, turning to you as soon as, as Jimmy goes up. Yeah, I'd almost feel bad for him if I could. Trigger. Oi? When you size up people, don't be less blatant about it. And he'll just walk away. All right, we'll end the scene there. Great. Who's next in the initiative order? Tori. Tori. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tori, um, I'm going to say this is going to happen the next day. So you are actually in a van with a bunch of other teenagers on your way to a camping trip. Now, this might sound really strange to you, and you actually felt really strange about it. But ever since you came back from your dream, that wasn't a dream, ever, ever since you came back from the manor, there's been a number of changes besides just Carmen not being a part of your life. You all of a sudden have this group of... I don't know if you would call them friends, like associates. Um, you kind of remember that they were Carmen's friends and she had convinced you to go on this camping trip because she felt like you need to like socialize with people more because after you broke things off with Pio, you've been kind of like even more in your own like shell than usual. And so she's been trying to like push you, encourage you to go out a little bit more. And so she figured, you know, maybe not go to a big giant party, but maybe go to a more intimate, like isolated camping trip with a group of her friends um, would do you some good. 
However, since Carmen doesn't exist, instead, your parents sort of like pushed you into like going on this trip just for a weekend. And maybe like, if you want to say maybe they bribed you to do it, like they, they promised they would get you, I don't know, something. Something they, that would have led you to say, oh, fine, I'll go to this stupid trip or whatever. Okay. And so you can decide if you actually like these people or not, um, or if you're just kind of going to be huffy about it. I'm sure you're still going to be like thinking about Carmen this whole time. But um, the people that are with you, so there's this blonde young man who's driving this van with broad features and a white t-shirt. His name is Ted. Um, there's an attractive redhead girl dressed in purple. Um, her name is Debbie. There's a short, mousy brunette with square glasses named Wilma. And a tall and lanky boy with a scruffy beard that the group just calls Scruffy. <laughs> okay. Scruffy has a dog. A Scottish Terrier Poodle Mix, which they call Scooty Poo. Uh, no so. word! <laughs> Scooty Poo. Scooty Poo. Scooty Poo. Scooty Poo. I'm done. Scottish, right. yes. I'm writing that down. <laughs> Scooty Poo. <laughs> and I'm going to say that Tori, how, I guess you're like just looking out the window, and because I'm assuming you're like not really into doing this. Yeah. And so... Um, Debbie, she actually will, um, she'll actually will, uh, turn to you and she'll say, Tori, are you okay? You're, um, you're awfully quiet over there. I'm fine. Why are you talking to me? I'm sorry. I'm just trying to make conversation. I, you know, I thought it would be the friendly thing to do. Well, I didn't want to be here. Oh, uh, she said, well, I, I'm i sure that, you know, if you give it a chance, you might have some fun out of it. Like what? Well, I heard that this campsite has a lake. We could go swimming. Uh, you like the water, don't you? I guess. Look, I... My parents made me go to this. This is this is not what I would be. This is not what I would choose to do. Oh, she looks a little like hurt by that. Um, she says, "I'm sorry. I had no idea that that you weren't really interested in going in the first place." Yeah. Well, they promised me a new dollhouse, so I I agreed. She's about to say something else when. Um, Ted pulls over to a gas station to fill up uh, the tank. And, uh, you know, he, I think that uh, Scruffy is going to jump out and he's going to stretch his legs. <sighs> I think I'm going to go grab some snacks. Anybody want to come with? And uh, Debbie will say, oh, I'll, co- I'll go with you, Scruffy. Um, Wilma is going to, like, adjust her glasses a bit and she's just going to, you know, survey the area. And uh, one of the uh, people, the, the, the attendant, the gas employee, is going to say, So, you kids are on your way camping. Are you going to them woods? And Ted says, uh, Yes, sir, we, we are. And, and uh, the attendant says, oh, I don't know about that. They say that the woods over there is cursed. C- c- cursed? Scruffy says as he's about to, like, you know, leave the door. I used to be a campground for teenagers. Kids from all over the world would come to it. But in the first year, campers would start having these accidents. Started out um, not too bad. Sprained ankle here and there. A broken bone there. Well, then three different kids had broken bones from three different incidents. And then finally, someone lost a thumb during an accident trying to chop some firewood. The camp almost closed down after the first year. Folks theorized that the counselors were incompetent, but they managed to continue into the next summer. And that was when, one by one, the 
cat furs would start disappearing without a trace. Search parties were sent out, but even the members of the search party started to disappear. They called off the community search and the police continued on. But then, one of the captains of the police force went missing too, and rumors say that they could hear the sounds of some machinery in the distance, almost like, well, almost like a chainsaw. <gasps> Yoinks, Scruffy says. Dinkies, <laughs> Wilma says. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tori, T- Tori's interest, uh, she's perked up, she's very interested, so she'll get out of her seat from the bus or wherever she is and curse, you say? <laughs> In the forest? Yes. Huh. Uh, Ted says, I don't know, gang. Maybe we shouldn't go to this particular campsite. Why not? Why not? Uh, I think Wilma says, well, I don't know. I'm kind of with Tori here. I'm kind of very curious about about these disappearances. What, did, 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 you, you, you want us to go into the, 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 the spooky woods? <laughs> Scruffy says. Yeah. But, 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 but why? What if we disappear too? I'm... I'm sure we'll be fine. We gotta, maybe we'll find these missing people. Debbie says, I, I don't know. These stories about a chainsaw? This is like not something I would necessarily want to sign up for. 